this was the world that young William Penn, son of Admiral William Penn of the Royal Navy, grew up in. William was born in 1644 during Cromwell's advancement. William's father had fought with Cromwell in Parliament on the Baron's side in the conflict, but he managed to stay on both sides in the power exchange, displaying himself to be more of a survivor than a man of principles. William, his son, saw little of his father during his informative years, with him being away at sea on long campaigns. He knew the green and the beauty of the English countryside, and was a sensitive spirit. He seemed to be concerned with questions of God and conscience at an early age. He warmed to certain religious leaders, who turned out to be more controversial for the times, and forward thinkers. Seeing the need for more flexibility in religion, and consequently political thought. This had a significant impact on young Penn's developing mind, which to some extent helped to shape his thinking. He also had strong opinions of his own that were forming. At the age of 12, he heard a traveling minister, Thomas Lowe, a Quaker, deliver a message that left an indelible impression. He would from then on steer away from institutionalized religion. Later, at the University of Oxford, where he was attending school, he took classes taught by the university dean, John Owen, where he encouraged religious toleration instead of supporting the royalist agenda of institutionalized religious domination. When Owen was dismissed from the university for his free-thinking ideas, he started teaching seminars at his home, to which William Penn attended. William was fined and censored for his continued support of Dean Owen. But rather than deterring him, he rebelled when they further tried to force his cooperation with greater religious controls, insisting he attend church every day and enforcement of required dress standards. His rebellion finally brought his expulsion from the university. This enraged his father, and was difficult for his mother as well, since their young son was drawing the wrong kind of attention to the family, and they did not seem to be able to control him. They decided to send him away to France, hoping he would mature in a different environment and where his conduct would not be witnessed by their neighbors and friends. He was 18 at the time. There he rejected the socially accepted Catholic Mass and was introduced to French Protestant theologian Maurice Samrant, an important French religious revolutionary who invited him to stay with him for a year. This less regimented theology of Omrant was more humanist and tolerant on predestination. He was a Calvinist, but differed in the idea that God will atone for all who exercise faith in him, not just those who he has predestined to salvation, which was the Calvin belief. This sounded better to William, who had never been able to accept much of what he had been taught about God and mankind's relationship to him. This is evident when he says, I never had any other religion in my life than what I felt. He returned home after a few years, and trying not to agitate his father again, entered school studying law. His father, Penn Sr., hoped to make his son a successful aristocrat. Then came another war. His father was again called up to fight the Dutch over trade rights. William decided to join his father at sea, and acted as an emissary between his father and the king. England won, and they returned home. William, seeing the dangers of war firsthand, softened toward his father a bit, and realized if he were to lose him in the conflict, it would have been a huge impact on him. He expressed this tender sentiment in a letter to his father while at sea. In 1666, his father sent him to oversee their Irish estate. While there, he met an old acquaintance, Thomas Lowe, the traveling Quaker minister he had met when he was twelve years old, a meeting that had touched him then to seek pure Christianity rather than organized religion. At that time, the new king, Charles II, began to crack down on all religions except the state Anglican. A ban was placed on all preaching of non-approved religions within five miles of any town. Young Penn was undeterred and attended Quaker meetings regularly, eventually being arrested. He was not yet a member, and rather than free himself by his admission of this fact, went to jail. 
He later joined the Quakers, or Society of Friends, as they were called. He was 22 now, and pleaded before the Crown Authority that it was unjust to incarcerate Quakers, since they held no political aspirations, such as the Puritans. Therefore, they were no real threat to the British hierarchy. His argument was not successful at getting him out of jail, but his family's rank with the king did. His father enraged. He was recalled home, where they argued, but could not be reconciled. Finally concerned about his own standing with the king, Penn Sr. renounced his son and disinherited him. Penn, now homeless, lived with the Quakers. The Quaker position on religion recognized what they called the equality of all men. They did not recognize rank or position. They refused to swear an oath to the king. All men are equal in the sight of God. They believed in Christianity, but believed official ministers are not required, and that everyone is able to hear the voice of God in their life. Their religious meetings at the time were quiet services, where the members sat and meditated, with no preacher and no formal remarks. If you felt so moved, you could share your spiritual impressions with each other. This was a view of faith that to Penn felt right, and he embraced the Quaker teachings and ideas. He joined with another teacher, George Fox, the father of Quakerism, who further shaped his thinking and experience, and I think taught him great courage. Even with the king's edict and force against their preaching, Fox, at great peril to his life, defied the king and continued to proselyte. Penn joined him, and they went on traveling missions through the country. The Quakers' ideas furthered the idea of individual liberty, again a dangerous idea to the king. In 